All right. Doug, you ready to go? I'm ready. Go ahead. Did you want to go first? Okay. I'll just put this on briefly. Um, so welcome if you're already on. Uh, we are going to have some pictures taken by Doug Hostetter in Vietnam and in Afghanistan. And we'll be starting a couple of minutes after the hour. Go ahead, Doug. Thank you. 
Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. What we've just been watching are some pictures that Doug Hostetter took in Afghanistan and before that in Vietnam. Um, we'll run them again at the end if you in part of the way through and you would like to, to see all of them. Um, I am John McAuliffe from the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee. Uh, we have, if you are on our newsletter list, you've seen that we've been doing a lot of webinars and Zooms over the last 18 months to find ways to continue our mission of trying to lift up the history of the U.S. war in Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, and the movement that successfully opposed it. Um, this program and one in two weeks are a little bit different. We're focusing on a more contemporary uh, reality and relating it to the Indochina experience. Um, a couple of mechanical things just to let you know how we're functioning. Uh, the chat has been disabled um, until we get to the point of the discussion uh, so that speakers get a chance to say what they want to say without everybody getting distracted. Um, Q&A is open. Uh, you're welcome to post questions and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. Um, this is being recorded. It will be on YouTube and we'll send out the YouTube link uh, tonight or tomorrow to everybody who is currently watching. Um, so I'm going to go off right, stop this share, uh, and uh, turn it over to Paul Lauder, who is the moderator for this webinar. Paul. Okay. Here I am. Huh? You're there. I'm, I'm, I'm not, you are. <laughs> No, we can hear you, Paul. Okay. Um, can't hear myself. There we go. All right. Many of us uh, who were alive on April 29th, 1975, and not just the ancient males on this panel, uh, will remember what became an iconic photograph. It showed frantic people lining up desperately ho hoping to be evacuated by helicopter from a roof in Saigon to an American aircraft carrier cruising off the coast. The helicopter lift that day and the next became symbolic of America's catastrophic war in Vietnam. Mainstream media have resurrected Hugh Van Esse's famous photograph to suggest parallels between those April days in 1975 and what has happened in Afghanistan. Perhaps. Certainly we do need to read and talk about the pictures from Saigon and Kabul, uh, how Americans and their allies fly off and what they leave. But my hope in proposing this webinar is to look more fully at how we got into the quagmire, first in Vietnam, then apparently having learned little or nothing in Afghanistan. What is it in American culture and politics in American foreign and military policy that again and again leads the nation into the big muddy? Is there something particularly American in that history? Or is it rather a story of big power chauvinism? What is it we need to know that induces American politicians and generals to make decisions that leave the US as well as the countries we would save worse off after our intervention than before. Why do American leaders seem to believe that the US can and should use its many guns and much money to reshape, reshape other countries? What do answers to such questions tell us about our country, its institutions, civil and military, and about the culture of our democracy itself? Needless to say, the cases of Vietnam and Afghanistan are not identical. For example, the National Liberation Front and the Taliban could hardly be more different in history, culture, religion, policies toward women and the like. 
nor are the reasons Americans intervened identical. Nevertheless, here we were once again in the morass. This webinar is designed to contribute to the emerging discussion of why and how in light of Vietnam and Afghanistan, future policies must be changed. We wanna consider the implication of President Biden's remarks in his speech on the subject, criticizing as a mistake, the attempt, I'm quoting him, to remake a country through the endless military deployments of US forces. Mistaken, malevolent, uninformed, silly, we need to reconsider the last half century of American interventions as we face an increasingly conflicted future. I'm gonna introduce the uh, participants on the panel one at a time. I should tell you that unfortunately, Soraya Sadid can't be with us as she was on the original list. Her daughter is undergoing a, a brain operation uh, just about at this time. And obviously she needs to be with her. First you lose a country and then you have a daughter uh, under the knife, terrible. We wish her all of our best and best strength. Our first speaker is Doug Hostetter, a Mennonite scholar, writer, and peace activist. He was a conscientious objector during the Vietnam War who chose to do his alternative service working for the Mennonite Central Committee in Tom Key, Vietnam from 1966 to 69. During his time in Vietnam, Doug established a literacy program which used Vietnamese high school students to teach thousands of Vietnamese children whose schools had been destroyed by the US military how to read and write. Doug was a specialist for peace at the United, Nation, United Methodist Office for the United Nations, was the director of the New England Office of the American Friends Service Committee, the director of the U.S. Fellowship of Reconciliation, and directed the Mennonite Central Committee United Nations Office for over a decade. Doug did two short-term assignments delivering humanitarian aid, some of which you saw in the slides, uh, to Afghanistan for the Mennonite Central Committee and the American Friends Service Committee in October, November 2001, and July, August of 2002. Doug has published widely on the issues of war, peace, and nonviolence, and is a contributing author to the People Make the Peace, Lessons from the Vietnam Anti-War Movement. Doug? Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, I should actually correct your um, introduction a bit. I don't view myself as a academic or a scholar, despite the books behind me. Uh, most of what I've learned has been through 50 years of citizen peace activism and um, humanitarian aid in various countries around the world. And most of what I've learned is actually from the people rather than from books. Um, I was privileged to actually spend three years in Vietnam from 1966 to 1969, doing my alternative service in a small village in central Vietnam, the village of Tham Ki. Um, those are the people who taught me about Vietnam. And um, two things stood out um, quite clearly. One was I very quickly was told that the Vietnamese have fought off foreign aggressors for 1,500 years. Uh, I remember one of my Vietnamese instructors telling me that at a uh, a thousand years ago, there were a hundred tribes of people below the Yangtze River in China. And now, a thousand years later, there's only one that is independent, and that's Vietnam. And how they had fought China for a thousand years. They had then fought uh, France for a hundred years, and they were now in the middle of a struggle against the Americans. Um, the people who were fighting Americans in Damki, and I got to know many people on both sides, the people who were fighting against us were not knowledgeable about Marx, Lenin, or Engels, or Mao Zedong. They were patriots who were fighting for their country against foreigners who had come in and invaded. One of the other things that 
became very clear as soon as I got to know what was happening in Thamki is that um, the, the government that the Americans had supported in Vietnam was a government that basically we had chosen. Um, and we had chosen basically the Christian minority in Vietnam. Actually, I, being, I believe Cardinal Spellman was responsible for finding their first president who was studying in upstate New York. Uh, and we thought he would be a good, a, a good president for, uh, for Vietnam, for the Americans. It seems that Western nations do not trust people who are not Christian. So many people who wanted to work for the French and later on for the Americans um, became Christians. And in Thamki, um, which was a provincial capital in which the vast majority of the people were farmers and fishermen and, and Buddhists and Taoists and Confucianists, all of the government leaders were Christian and they were all from the big cities. None of the local people were at all involved. As a matter of fact, there's a Vietnamese saying that goes, het gao, lay down, nui kong. If you translate that into uh, English, it'd roughly be, uh, if your rice bag is empty, adapt your religion to feed your children. And that's not to say that everybody who became a Christian in Vietnam was an opportunist, but it is to say that any opportunist that wanted to work with the French or the Americans basically had to become Christian. So you had the Americans supporting a basically foreign government that had no link at all to the people in the village where I was working. Um, perhaps the most articulate uh, uh, description of the Vietnamese situation was from a cab driver in Saigon in 1970 when I was back for a visit and I will never forget, I, I wrote it down in my uh, journal immediately afterwards so I wouldn't forget it. And I'll, I'll read it to you verbatim. You Americans can come and do what you want. Eventually, you will withdraw just like the French after 80 years. You can bomb all you want. We will fill up the holes and continue as before. Bring in all the troops you want. Eventually, you will leave and we will still be here. You can bring in all the money you want. You can buy some Vietnamese. You can buy, but you can't buy their hearts. You may be able to buy a Vietnamese woman for a night. You might even be able to get her to marry you. But when you get on the plane and go back to the United States, she won't be on the plane. Whatever you do, eventually you are going to have to leave. And in the end, Vietnam is ours. It was so eloquently stated, and I think um, uh, the exact same thing would uh, prove true for the Cambodians, uh, for the uh, Afghans as well. Um, I learned from my experience in Vietnam that um, people respond favorably, even in the middle of the war, if rather than bringing guns and bombs and destructive things, if you bring the things that people actually need. I remember when the World Trade Center was struck and when very soon thereafter, it became clear to me that the United States was about to attack uh, the poorest country in Asia, uh, a country that was so poor that before the American war started, UNICEF had registered that 70% of the Afghan people were undernourished. It seemed absurd to me, the most powerful nation in the world attacking the poorest country in Asia. I'd worked for both Mennonites and Quakers. And so I contacted the American Friends Service Committee and the Mennonite Central Committee. And I said, you know, the AFSC and MCC should work together and provide Americans for an alternative for how we respond to the Afghan people. You may not be able to determine how your tax dollars uses and what the American government does with your tax dollars, but you can actually, we could actually give the American an option. We could take food and blankets to the Afghan people and medicine, things that they actually need. Um, and actually at that point already, it was clear to me 
that this war was going to be a war against Islam. And I said, if we are going to do this with integrity, we actually have to work with a, a, a Muslim organization in this effort. Both AFSC and MCC agreed. Uh, they didn't think it would be possible to pull off, but encouraged me to explore. And I soon discovered an amazing Afghan-American woman, Soraya Sadid, who uh, would have been with us were it not for medical situations today. And she had started a small Afghan-American organization called Help the Afghan Children. And already when I contacted her, just a few weeks after September 11th, I learned that she had already organized a material aid um, delegation that was going to go, um, she was going to take food to Northern Afghanistan. And I asked her, would she welcome the Quakers and the Mennonites to also contribute to purchasing this food? And she said, of course. And I said, would you welcome Mennonites and Quakers joining you? And she said, of course. So I got back in touch with MCC and AFSC and uh, both of the Asia directors said, well, they were really busy that week. And uh, unfortunately they couldn't do it, but would I represent both organizations? So I was really privileged to have left seven weeks after September 11th and carried $130,000 in cash to Tajikistan where we found a supplier who would convert our $130,000 in cash into 19 truckloads of wheat, sugar, and cooking oil in the exact proportions that you need for making Afghan plat bread. We paid them half of the money in Dushanbe in Tajikistan and told them they would get the other half when they brought the food to Afghanistan. And Sarai and I went ahead uh, to prepare uh, things when we were there. It was an amazing experience. Um, in a little over a week, we were able to um, bring our food together into uh, family packets. And each packet had enough food uh, for making Afghan bed, uh, bread for seven people for one month. And uh, in a few weeks time, we were able to distribute to 3,600 Afghan families. And the amazing thing was we were, we were literally a few kilometers away from where the Americans were bombing the Taliban front line. We were kind of on the Northern Alliance side of that line. And all of the people that were in these displaced persons camps were people who had fled their homes because of American bombing. But what I had learned in Vietnam and what was also true in Afghanistan, if you take people the things that they need and you give it to them with respect and dignity, you will be welcomed and befriended even by people whose homes have been destroyed by your government bombs. There is an alternative. We could relate differently to Afghanistan. We need to relate differently to Afghanistan now. They still need help, but not in guns and bombs. I thank you. Thank you very much, Doug. Um, I guess I am. Here I am. Um, our next speaker is Laura Jadid. She is a writer and journalist and uh, Afghan war veteran who's based in New York City. She joined the US Army, she says, at 18, out of the belief that the global war on terror would keep Americans safe and bring freedom and democracy to people overseas who wanted it. Our subsequent two deployments disabused her of that notion, and she now advocates for an end to colonialist projects and the ideas that lead to them. Laura. Laura, you're... So much for the, the myth of millennials understanding technology. I'm glad I could disabuse us all of that. Um, thank you very much for having me. Um, 
I am, I'm not a scholar. I'm not a longtime activist or a humanitarian, or, or I don't really have any of the credentials that other people on this panel do. What I am is somebody who got very swept up in a story that America told itself in the wake of 9-11. It's a story, uh, I think versions of that story have echoed down through our long and sometimes sordid history. It adapts itself very neatly to whatever situation we seem to find ourselves in, and it seems to lead to the same place. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that story today. Um, I remember very clearly watching the towers go down as so many of us did. And I remember feelings of shock giving way to feelings of anger, which were very much nurtured at the time by the news and by our president and by I think the legacy of that story, a story in which America is good and the enemies of America are evil. Uh, this story that we are exceptional and that we know how people ought to live, that our way is correct and can be exported without customization or really any particular care to anyone in the world who might oppose us, that the, the problem with America is simply one of perception. People just don't understand how good we are. And if they could only embrace freedom and democracy in the way that we do, they would no longer have any problems with us. Um, and also, at the same time, a strangely authoritarian cult of the soldier. You'll have to excuse me, I'm in New York City. This is the, I don't know if you can hear the, the sound of the street outside, but it's, it's a bit loud. Anyhow, um, the cult of the soldier, I think everyone will remember at the time was really quite extraordinary. It's less virulent now than it was, but it's still very much with us. This idea that freedom isn't free and that people need to go over and defend it with violence and that the people who do this are our heroes. Now, I am not here to advocate a return to the post-Vietnam era of spitting on soldiers or anything like that. It's just that this idea of the virtue of authoritarianism is fascinating when you think about it for a country that defines itself so often as this, this avatar of freedom. And this is something I've, I've been thinking about a lot lately because there is a strange contradiction that I think has haunted us since September 11th, this idea that freedom defines us and it's what makes us good, but also it's what made us so vulnerable on September 11th. Um, if you go back and watch the footage, you'll hear the word vulnerable used over and over again. This idea that they hate us for our freedoms, that we are attacked because we're free, um, an idea that our freedom leads us to be weak, you know, our, our silly ideas of civil liberties, uh, our insistence on things like the Fourth Amendment, um, our objection to large authoritarian structures like the, uh, the Department of Homeland Security or ICE, these things make us weak and have to be overcome. And so what you have is this notion that what we need is a, a sort of jacket of authoritarianism around the, the cold and delicate body of freedom. And that's what appealed to me the propaganda that I saw uh, nightly on Fox News growing up, uh, I was 14 when the towers fell and 18 when I enlisted, told me that, that some of my worst impulses were virtues. The idea that a desire for violence could be a virtue, that a desire to make people conform to whatever I thought was right was a virtue, that it was actually very good to, to do these things, that we were doing people a favor that we were going to go and, and show the you know, poor blighted Afghans the best way to live, which was our way of living. And it's very appealing. It's a very appealing story that we fall for over and over again. I was not alive during the Vietnam War, but it seems like a similar story was told back then with the Cold War, that we were the avatars of freedom and goodness and that we needed to fight the evil communists wherever they might go. And that you know this therefore the, the proxy wars and the great harm that we did to people was, was actually a virtue instead of a, a terrible tragedy. And what I learned in the military, in two deployments of, uh, of military intelligence, seeing what people thought of us, seeing how much attention we paid to the structure or the, the, the way of life of the Afghans, the decentralized tribal nature of Afghanistan culture, especially in the East is something that we had really no interest in exploring or understanding and seeing how badly we were doing with training um, the Afghan National Army, a force that existed primarily because we were paying very well and giving out weapons. You can't export freedom at the barrel of a gun. You can force somebody to act, but you cannot force them to think. 
And for a country that likes to talk about how much we love freedom and democracy and the right to choose and how important it is to, to be free to make choices, we certainly do seem to have this notion that we can make people free. We can force them to be free. And there are still people in this country right now who argue that we should still be forcing the Afghans to be free. Freedom, of course, being that they do what we want them to do. And ironically enough, what we have done is not make anyone free, but we have made ourselves far less free than we were to start with. We've brought the authoritarianism home. They said that Osama bin Laden hated us for our freedoms, that the Islamic extremisms wished to destroy them. And if that's the case, they needn't have bothered because we did it ourselves. We live in a massive surveillance state. Our police are militarized with weapons of war developed for the war in Afghanistan and, and made surplus by that war. We are burdened with DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, a, a thing that has very little oversight and a bloated budget. ICE terrorizes immigrants and also has the freedom to conduct um, unwarranted searches and seizures against anyone within 100 miles of a foreign border, which by the way is two thirds of Americans. And we also get to have political violence as a way of life. In the aftermath of Vietnam, we saw far right activity increase. We're seeing the same thing today. When you lose a war and you tell people that patriotism is very important, that violent patriotism is good, it creates a milieu that allows for the rise of far right extremism that endangers the society as we know it. America is a powder keg and you can trace a lot of that back to September 11th. And we should have known better. The people on this panel who remember Vietnam know that we learned this lesson before. It's just that we refused to. And I hope maybe this time America can look at itself and realize that we aren't by default good, that we don't know what's best for others, that perhaps what we should do is focus not on making the world better or remaking it in its our image, but in making ourselves good remaking ourselves in the image that we'd like to see. Thank you. Wonderful, Laura, thank you so much. Um, uh, our third speaker is, uh, is Skip Isaacs, more formally R Arnold R. Isaacs. He covered the closing years and final days uh, of the Vietnam War as a correspondent for the Balmer Sun. He's the author of Without Honor, Defeat in Vietnam and Cambodia, named a notable book of the year um, by both the New York Times and the American Library Association. A new updated version, uh, an updated edition will be released in the coming months. He's also the author of Vietnam Shadows, The War, Its Ghosts and Its Legacy, and an online report from troubled lands listening to Pakistani and Afghan Americans in post 9-11 America, available at the uh, WW uh, from troubled lands net. Uh, we, can, we can post that later on on the, on the chat. Following his career in daily journalism, along with writing numerous articles and reviews for various print and online publications, he uh, spent a number of years teaching or conducting training programs for journalists and uh, journalism students in more than 20 countries in Eastern Europe, Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. His website is www.arnoldisaacs.net. Skip, you're on. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I, for fear of running out of time, I, I thought I, I've started this talk, or when I wrote my notes for this talk, I started out with my conclusions, or actually the conclusions that I reached uh, after covering those last uh, years and days in Vietnam of Vietnam. And the, the subject of these, of these conclusions is corruption, uh, which is a, an issue that uh, one, one of my conclusions was that corruption was the biggest single reason that that war was lost, not the only reason, but the biggest, the most important, the most, the most fatal. And the, and the other one was that corruption wasn't damaging only because it loses popular support, although that's the argument that you almost always hear. Uh, but it seemed to me that 
uh, an even more important consequence of corruption as I saw it in Vietnam was that it subverted the leadership, the, the leadership that we were trying to support up and down the chain of command. Uh, the South Vietnamese who ran that war in the national government and the provinces and the districts with a few, but not very many exceptions, were not out to defeat the enemy or provide government services. They were there to profit from corruption. Uh, and officers and officials who wanted to govern or fight honestly uh, were a threat to that system and were consistently frozen out. They were kept in positions where they had no power to change those corrupt practices. And I, I met plenty of those honest officers and they were uh, in some cases, the most demoralized people I met in Vietnam. And then in the end, it was that leadership that lost the war, the leadership that was created largely by a system of uh, corruption. I'll give a couple of examples later to the, the extent that I can in this limited time. Now, I don't have the same firsthand knowledge about Iraq or Afghanistan. I visited Afghanistan once in the 1970s, when as nobody remembers, Afghanistan was actually in a fairly progressive, or at least in the cities, in Kabul, not out in the, in the boondocks, but the, uh, the sort of governing the national climate was much more progressive, say, than right next door in Pakistan. Uh, but I, so I don't, but I don't, I have not been there at all during the period of these wars that, that began soon after that trip. Uh, but the evidence looks pretty overwhelming that, as in other respects, that the, the situation in those countries is much the same as a lot of echoes from Vietnam. And that corruption was pretty much the same that I saw in, in the war I attended, and that it undercut. The, those war efforts that is in Iraq and Afghanistan in just about the same way. It to, on a long, long list of examples, let me give just one example. I'll try to get through this as fast as I can. Excuse me while I... Adjust my screen here. And this is from a few weeks after I, I got to Vietnam, the, the, my first weeks in Vietnam in June of 1972, I spent a day in Taining province, north of Saigon, which goes up to the Cambodian border. And I, this is the story that I heard there. In that area, the, the communist units acquired virtually all of their supplies other than weapons and ammunition, but everything else, food, fuel, medicines, uh, radios, bicycle and motorbike parts, that kind of thing. Almost all of those they acquired illegally from inside the government zone. And a lot of those goods were transported in that region by river, including on South Vietnamese Navy river patrol boats that were regularly carried supplies up river from their base to the border area on the Cambodian border where they were sold to be sent on into the communist held territory inside Cambodia. Now that route the, 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 on the way to the border the boats passed, I suppose more than one, but they passed one, at least one riverbank outpost that was manned by the popular forces, the local militia commonly called PFs, who as you could imagine, were not very happy to see supplies heading up past their position to enemy troops who might someday bring them back down and fire on them. So one day the PF stopped in one of those Navy boats and confiscated its cargo. And a day or so after that, a Navy truck pulled up to the gate of the outpost, dropped its tailgate and trained a 50 caliber machine gun on the 20 or so uh, PF soldiers who were inside, ordered them to climb into the truck, drove them down to the, na to the Navy base downstream, held them there for 36 hours or so, beating some of them, and then took them back to the outpost with a stern warning not to interfere with the Navy's business dealings anymore. Now, I didn't hear that story from a political dissident or a war critic. Uh, I heard it from a US intelligence officer stationed in the province capital, in the provincial capital, Taining City. And sitting next to him, as he told it, was the South Vietnamese National Police Commander for the province, who sat there shamefacedly nodding and confirmed all the details, and then added his own, because he told me that the Navy wasn't the only branch of the South Vietnamese military trading with the enemy. Those goods were also transported in convoys of army vehicles uh, with, with the connivance of officers up to the division command or, or higher. And that trade, the, the police commander said, was protected from very high levels and there was nothing he could do about it. 
Now this was after 10 years, 10 years when military, US military advisors were attached to virtually every South Vietnamese military unit down to battalion or in cases company level. Every bullet, every gallon of gasoline, every dollar of soldiers pay was paid for by the US government. And Americans knew presumably what was going on. Remember it was a US spook who told me about those river boats. And I'm, it's still kind of mystifying to me why they didn't do more to stop that traffic, which they certainly were in position, could have done, but they didn't. Now, I spent nearly three more years covering that war, and I had many, many more firsthand encounters with corruption there and in Cambodia, where it was even more flagrant and destructive. And those convinced me that the story I heard in Taining that day in my early weeks was not an isolated case, but represented the broader reality. And it's a reality that seems to have been replicated in many ways in our recent wars. I don't have the same kind of firsthand knowledge, uh, but to cite just one of many sort of eerie echoes, the practice of listing fictitious names on military rosters so that commanders could pocket their pay was endemic in Vietnam. And apparently it's identical or everything I've read suggests to me that it was that the identical practice occurs in Iraq and Afghanistan. But not only that, in the Vietnamese and, and Iraqis in their respective languages have the exact same slang term for those imaginary troops. That in both languages, they're called ghost soldiers. Now, there's another parallel, which is that well, despite controlling all the purse strings, Americans in all three of those wars were astonishingly unsuccessful in reducing corruption in any of them. Official reports like the ones from the, uh, the CIGARs, the Special Inspectors General for Iraq and Afghanistan, regularly it list, include corruption on their list of significant problems. But the ones I've read almost never say anything about a successful or even partly successful action to control it. And when they use the word progress, it almost always, it, maybe all the time, it's a, it, it refers to an announcement of a new campaign or some organizational reshuffle, but not any concrete result. You'd think that the Americans would have figured out a, a, some strategy by now, and it's really puzzling why they haven't. And my final point, uh, corruption is damaging and dangerous, not just in the context of these unsuccessful wars. It's a much bigger threat than that. It's a worldwide threat to stability and, and a great many US interests in a lot of places around the globe. Corruption is a big cause, a crucial cause of migration crisis in Central America, for example. Uh, during the, 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 all the chatter in the last few days about 9-11 and the anniversary, I found myself wondering, what if instead of having a global war on terror, we had put our resources and strategic commitment after 9-11 into a global war on corruption. And if we'd done that, might the world now, 20 years later, look a little bit more hopeful than the one we're seeing? I don't know whether we would have, if we had done that, whether we would have found a way to be successful or not, but we would have been declaring the war on a, on a more significant and more important enemy than by far than terrorism is. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Skip, very much, and uh, for bringing your uh, perceptions and uh, experience to bear. Um, our next speaker is Bruce Franklin. Um, Bruce is a former Air Force navigator and intelligence officer, a progressive activist for six decades. I think we've known each other for five or six of those. Um, and an author or editor of 20 books. He's won the highest awards in fields as diverse as prison literature, science fiction, and marine ecology, and the Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Studies Association. For his latest work on the Vietnam War and the Forever War, see his homepage, hbrucefranklin, no, no dots, dot com. Um, I should add, um, I, I, I always picture Bruce in the middle of the Hotel Americana lobby when we were having a sit-in uh, and the, the whole out, outer rim of the lobby is uh, filled with a tax squad 
and Bruce conducting this uh, this meeting of, of uh, radicals at the Modern Language Association, uh, making everybody raise their hands, including the MLA brass. It was a wonderful moment for which I've always wanted to publicly thank him. <laughs> anyway, Bruce. You're not, you're, you're not, um, are, are, are you turn on, is your audio on? How about now? There, it, yeah, there you are. Okay. Okay. So the last weekly celebration of my lifetime was on August 14th, 1945, the day that Japan surrendered. I was 11 years old in the back of a pickup uh, filled with other boys and girls Ooh, in a motorcade in our Brooklyn neighborhood, jammed with people waving American flags, homemade signs, hugging each other, dancing. We kids in the truck were screaming, peace, the world, the world, the world is over, the, the war is over. We thought we were going to live the rest of our lives in a nation at peace. The very same day, the people of Vietnam launched their revolution against colonial rule. In less than two weeks, they swept aside the Japanese occupiers and united the whole country. On September 2nd, Half a million people packed Hanoi, where Ho Chi Minh read their Declaration of Independence, which began with ours. Suddenly, two P-38 warplanes swooped overhead. The crowd looked up. When they recognized the planes as Americans, that half a million people, like a single being, laid out an earth-shaking cheer. The Vietnamese believed that we Americans were their friends and allies, champions of their freedom from colonialism. Little did they know that 10 days earlier, President Truman had agreed to finance, arm, and transport a French invasion army to restore colonial rule. A dozen US troop ships were diverted from bringing JIs home from Europe to carrying the French invasion army with their American planes and tanks to Vietnam. The empires were prepared to fight back. The British arrived in mid-September and rearmed the Japanese who joined the British in waging war against the Vietnam nation. Japanese and British planes joined in bombing and spraking together. When the US troop ships arrived with the French invasion army later that fall, they were met by uniformed armed Japanese soldiers who manned machine guns on towers overlooking the American ships. The Sarahs were outraged. Every single enlisted man on those ships signed a petition to Congress and the president condemning the US government for quote, imperialist policies designed to subjugate the native population of Vietnam. That was the beginning of our movement against the Vietnam War. That's a great detail. Wow, great detail. Oh my God. Uh -huh. I don't know what that was. Um, Vietnam's War of Independence, this is, the, I think, the crucial point, was actually the vanguard of a 30 year global revolution that destroyed the old colonial system of imperialism. By 1954, France was beaten despite 250 US pilots flying US planes with French markings. 
President Eisenhower prepared for open US military intervention. Vice President Nixon declared that the US had to quote, dispatch forces because the Vietnamese lacked the ability to conduct a war or govern themselves. What a strange and revealing statement. Protests against colonialism and imperialism came from the entire political spectrum in the United States. An American Legion division with 78,000 members demanded that, quote, the US should refrain from dispatching any of its armed forces to Southeast Asia. A Gallup poll revealed that 68% agreed. Senators from both parties agreed. Carol Senator L. Johnson declared, quote, I am against sending American GIs into the mud and muck of Indochina on a bloodletting spree to perpetuate colonialism and white man's exploitation in Asia. The anti-war movement is blamed for forcing the military to fight with one arm tied behind its back. But this stands reality on its head. The American people kept Washington at first from going in overtly, so it went in covertly. It thereby committed itself to deception, hiding its actions from the American people. The anti-war movement was outraged not just by the war, but by the lies about the war. In 1973, Washington was forced to sign a peace treaty that included word for word every major demand made by the so-called Viet Cong back in 1969. Then in 1975, the Saigon public government and its armed forces fled in panic. The truth was that for three decades, our nation had sponsored and then waged a genocidal war against a people and a nation that had never done anything to us except ask for our friendship and support. 1975, the same year, was the year when the last bastion of out and out colonialism, that is Portugal's three uh, colonies in Africa, won independence. Meanwhile, the American people had learned that our government routinely lied This is the one truth that both sides of today's divided America agree on, that the government lies to us. Once again, it was 1945, we dreamed of no more wars. Well, that lasted maybe four years, which brings us to Afghanistan. We're told that's America's longest war, 20 years. Well, the U.S. war in Afghanistan did not start 20 years ago, but 41 years ago, when the U.S., together with Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, created the heroic freedom fighters, the Mujahideen, the jihadists, glorified in Rambo III. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, you've introduced a very different dimension into the discussion. Thank you very much. Um, our last speaker is Ben Kiernan. He's the A. Whitney Griswold Professor of History at Yale. He was founding director of the Cambodian Genocide Program and the Genocide Studies Program from 1994 to 2015, and has chaired Yale's Council on Southeast Asian Studies. His books include How Pol Pot Came to Power, The Pol Pot Regime, 
genocide and resistance in Southeast Asia, Blood and Soil, a world history of genocide and extermination from Sparta to Darfur, and Vietnam, a history from earliest times to the present. Kiernan's work has appeared in 12 languages and is featured in Southeast Asia, Essential Readings, and in 50 Key Thinkers on the Holocaust and Genocide. For three decades, Kiernan documented the crimes of the Khmer Rouge regime. Under his direction, Yale's Cambodian Genocide Program established the Documentation Center of Cambodia, uncovered the archives of the Khmer Rouge secret police, detailed the case for an international tribunal, and won multiple internet awards. Ben, you're on. Thank you very much, Paul. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, as you mentioned, many commentators have compared the Taliban capture of Kabul last month to the fall of Saigon in 1975. Fewer have mentioned the fall just two weeks earlier than that of Cambodia's capital, Phnom Penh. The Taliban less closely resemble Vietnamese communists than they do Pol Pot's Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. There are of course important differences, but also several similarities between the Taliban and the Khmer Rouge. More than two decades ago, when the Taliban, who are a Sunni Islamist group, held power in Afghanistan, they massacred members of their country's Shia Muslim minority, as well as others. And in the late 1970s, the Khmer Rouge committed genocide against Cambodia's Cham Muslim minority, along with others. In early 2001, the Taliban deployed dynamite to blow up their country's monumental 6th and 7th century stone sculptures, the Bamiyan Buddhas, part of Afghanistan's historic heritage. Yeah. That act the Khmer Rouge's earlier demolition and mission of Cambodia's Buddhist religion. A month ago, Ashley Jackson wrote in the New York Times, quote, many Afghans I've spoken with in cities now fear the worst, recalling what life was like under Taliban rule before 2001. The urban areas arguably suffered worst as they represented moral danger and corruption to the Taliban, unquote. Excuse me. Does the Taliban's anti-urban thinking recall the Khmer Rouge and their forced evacuation of Phnom Penh and Cambodia's other cities in 1975? It still remains to be seen whether the now reinstalled Taliban regime will launch a new campaign of Islamist fundamentalist repression. Recent statements from female Afghan journalists that, quote, we see silence filled with fear and reports of the murders of opponents and severe beatings of journalists are ominous. So is the news that in Bamiyan province, the Taliban recently blew up the statue of a Shia leader whom they had killed in 1996. Another parallel between Cambodia and Afghanistan is the way since 2005, the Taliban recruited and rebuilt the army that has swept them back to power this year. In some cases, the brutal prosecution of an external war may damage local moderate forces that help generate the ascendancy of a hardline or even a genocidal insurgent group. This happened in Cambodia in the early 1970s when the spread of the Vietnam War there facilitated the rise of the Khmer Rouge regime led by Pol Pot. As in Cambodia, one important factor in Afghanistan has been rural revulsion against heavy United States bombing of the countryside and other excessive uses of military force. As early as March 2002, Donald Rumsfeld sent out this memo to his staff. 
quote, please see me about having a weekly meeting on Afghanistan. I'm getting concerned. I'm getting concerned that it is drifting, unquote. However, that same day, Rumsfeld gave a long interview to MSNBC without mentioning his concern about the drifting situation in Afghanistan. Instead, he argued that there was no point in negotiating with Taliban remnants. He stated, quote, the only thing you can do is to bomb them and try to kill them. And that's what we did. And it worked. They're gone, unquote. Well, no, they weren't gone. And bombing them and trying to kill them, often hitting innocent bystanders, only helped to bring the Taliban roaring back. According to Human Rights Watch, US and NATO airstrikes killed 116 Afghan civilians in 2006 and 321 civilians in 2007. The London Guardian reported in 2007, quote, British and NATO officials have consistently expressed concern about US tactics, notably airstrikes, which kill civilians sabotaging the battle for hearts and minds, unquote. But the death toll kept rising. Airstrikes took the lives of 530 of the 828 civilians killed in 2008 by US or Afghan government forces. In early 2010, the New York Times reported that in Afghanistan, quote, civilian deaths caused by American troops and American bombs have outraged the local population and made the case for the insurgency, unquote. Three weeks later, the paper added that the persistence of deadly convoy and checkpoint shootings by US forces, quote, has led to growing resentment among Afghans, fearful of Western troops and angry at what they see as the impunity with which the troops operate, a friction that has turned villages firmly against the occupation, unquote. General Stanley McChrystal, then in 2010, the senior US and NATO commander in Afghanistan, expressed regret that, quote, the instinctive responses by an Afghan man to defend his home and family are sometimes interpreted as insurgent acts with tragic results. McChrystal added that in Afghanistan, we have shot an amazing number of people, but to my knowledge, none has ever proved to be a threat." Unquote. Even so, the casualties from such shootings were reported to be fewer in number than deaths from airstrikes and special forces operations. Over the next year, for instance, official statistics revealed that US special operations forces killed more than 1,500 Afghan civilians in night raids in less than 10 months in 2010 and 11. Many Afghans who had known the victims of these shootings, airstrikes and special forces operations eventually did become a threat. They joined the Taliban army, which is now victorious. One difference between the US departures from Cambodia and Afghanistan is that many of the leaders of the US backed Khmer Republic chose to remain behind in Phnom Penh to meet their fate. The Khmer Rouge, like the Taliban, had promised that they would be conciliatory and that they would punish only the so-called top seven traitors. President Lon Nol himself flew out to the USA on April 1st, 1975, followed by his army chief. But other top leaders, Sirik Matat and Long Boret, for instance, courageously chose to stay in Cambodia, knowing that they would be killed. So did most of the Cambodian cabinet, including the genial Minister for Social Welfare, Pan Soti, and the Minister for Refugees and Community Development, Kong On, who had very kindly helped me to leave Phnom Penh after I became stranded there two months earlier. All these brave men, along with many others, were murdered by Pol Pot's Khmer Rouge. The fact that 30 years later, specific US military operations contributed to 
or even provoked rather than prevented the resurgence of the Taliban in Afghanistan is a tragic, not merely ironic repetition of history. The initial US involvement in Afghanistan after the September 11th attacks and the Taliban sheltering of Al Qaeda had the justification of self-defense, unlike the subsequent illegal US invasion of Iraq. But just as the Iraq war saw the rise of the genocidal ISIS group in Iraq and Syria, the prolonged conflict in Afghanistan, and in particular, the US resort to bombardment of rural areas helped fuel the return of the Taliban as a formidable force. The Afghanistan war might have been conducted very differently, especially in the light of the lesson of what had earlier happened in Cambodia. Thank you. Before Paul goes to the discussion among the panelists, I want to remind people that I am going to open the chat so that you can communicate among yourselves and, and with us directly. That's now happened. And, but if you have questions for any of the speakers, please put it in the uh, Q&A box and we will sort them and, and try to ask as many as possible. Um, so again, I'll turn it back to Paul, who I should have introduced in the beginning as a retired professor from Trinity and former head of the American Studies Association and a member of the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee, as is Doug. Uh, so we have a certain amount of uh, in-house talent that we wanted to share with you. So, Paul. Okay. Uh, let, let me suggest that uh, the members of the panel um, uh, get yourself uh, off mute because uh, I see a number of you are, are muted. Skip and, uh, and Doug, you're, you're both muted. Um, this is the time for uh, interaction among the panelists. And um, uh, if, if you have questions or comments that you'd like to share with uh, one another, uh, this is the time to do so. And uh, let, me, let, me, let me start with one thing. Um, and that is, uh, let me change this so I can actually look at people. Um, you know, I was active uh, in the anti-war movement during the, uh, the Vietnam period and uh, was the uh, director of um, the U.S. Servicemen's Fund, which despite its innocuous title was a, an organization designed to encourage um, GI resistance to the war, let's face it. And um, uh, one of the, the, the things that was so observable, uh, Nixon's um, uh, change from ground war to air war, um, because uh, once you eliminated the draft um, and very few Americans were involved in the military, uh, what did you do? You, you shifted your, your uh, strategy. You began to bomb even more than you had been bombing before. Uh, and uh, I, I wonder to what extent we have uh, the, the American uh, establishment did learn one lesson from Vietnam, uh, a bad lesson, which is that uh, your primary emphasis needs to be on bombing the shit out of people uh, uh, rather than getting your, your uh, many of your troops involved. I'm curious whether anybody has any response to that or ignore it and uh, ask your own questions and comments uh, as we go forward. What, what, what you are saying, Paul, relates to what Ben is saying, but it's a, it's a, a much deeper historical basis for this. It's the whole concept of aerial bombing 
Yeah. Which is a form of terrorism. It's a fascist theory of war. I mean, I've written tons of about that. And where has it where where has it worked? I mean, did the Nazi bombing of of London terrorize the people enough to want to give up the war? It doesn't work. What it does, it creates hatred and enemies wherever it's used. I would just add something about the difference uh, between the Johnson administration and the Nixon administration during the war. The Johnson administration also bombed Cambodia, although it wasn't uh, covered at the time from 1965 to 1969, but it was tactical fighter bombers, which were much more precise. Uh, they still uh, inflicted a lot of casualties, but nothing like the strategic bombing uh, of the B-52s that Kissinger and Nixon introduced in 1969, at first secretly, and then widespread all over Cambodia from 1970 to 73, which increased the casualty rate enormously. So there was a, a the, the Johnson administration were, were much more particular about uh, the, the uh, refusing to introduce strategic bombing by B-52s uh, inside Cambodia. Uh, and and uh, also, I'd like to uh, use a Cambodian example to support what Skip said about corruption. Uh, when I was in Cambodia in the last months of the Long Nong regime, I heard a story which has not yet uh, been verified, but I think uh, I heard it from in, uh, sources that, that could be accurate, which was that some of the Long Nong uh, generals owned airlines. And although the communists had cut the roads throughout much of the country, uh, the story I heard was that some of the generals who owned airlines would cut the roads to provincial capitals in order to benefit uh, their own airlines uh, and, and make, make their airline uh, services much more profitable. Uh, so the, the level of corruption, as you said, Skip, in the Long Nol regime was extraordinary. Uh, perhaps rivaling that in, in South Vietnam. But, uh, but it was also one reason why the Long Nol regime lost. But the, the level of, uh, of bombardment of Cambodia was, uh, was, was extraordinary as well, particularly in the Long Nol period from 1970 to 73. And that lesson was not learned, uh, as we heard from Rumsfeld in 2002, all we can need to do is bomb them and, and kill them. You know, that, that was not learned even to the extent that the Johnson administration uh, was aware of it. It was certainly true in Vietnam in the, in the province where I worked that the way in which the Americans fought the war uh, created the enemies that we were fighting. Uh, and the difference between the way in which the National Liberation Front fought the war and the way the Americans fought the war was like night and day. Um, one of the guerrillas told a friend of mine once that the most important weapon for a guerrilla is a knife. My friend was really surprised and said, what do you mean? A knife is the most important. He said, with a knife, you never make a mistake. You never kill a child or a woman when you think you're killing a provincial uh, officer. When you use a gun, you can sometimes kill the wrong person. When you use a grenade, you will always kill more than the person that you intended. When you use a 250 pound bomb or a 500 or 1000 pound bomb, you will always kill innocent people. And the Americans, partly because we wanted to keep American casualties down. We used heavy weapons and we made, we killed many, many innocent people. The NLF in the area where I was never made a mistake. Uh, sure, they, they did capture and kill some local officials when they took over Thamki, as they did about a dozen times while I was there, usually for a few hours in the middle of the night. But they would pick specific government officials. And I remember when they, arrested and kidnapped and took out uh, the uh, Minister of Education. 
And the Americans said, this is terrible. The National Liberation Front, you know, abducted this minister of education. I was working in education. I knew that that minister was taking a 10% cut out of every teacher's uh, salary in the entire province. So when he was kidnapped, everybody celebrated. Uh, it was a big city Catholic and not a local person. And he was a corrupt person. Uh, the Americans, however, used heavy weaponry. And later on, they used uh, Agent Orange. Uh, when they couldn't control the area and they wanted to drive the people out, um, they first would use artillery and bombs and still the people wouldn't leave. And so finally, they would just defoliate the entire area. And then the farmers had to leave. Uh, you couldn't just live underground because everything was killed. You could dig up the potatoes and sweet potatoes uh, and peanuts that were fairly mature before the defoliation fell and you could live on them until they were gone and then you had to move. And we forced all of the people from the rural areas of Quang Nam province into the urban areas so that we could control it. Every one of those people were forced from their homes, hated the Americans passionately as any of us would. Uh, so the way in which we fight our wars creates the enemies that hate us. I, I think that's somewhat idealizing the way the communists fought the war. I don't know about the province where you were or your personal experience, but I saw lots of places where the communist side used mortars and rockets and fired more or less randomly. And the Khmer Rouge certainly did that in Cambodia into villages and, and province towns and so on and blew up schools and killed kids and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's, it's uh, the Americans had sort of vastly more firepower and, and did more damage, that's for sure. But I don't think the communist side war was quite as uh, sanitary as, as you describe it. No, that's they, from they, what I saw. Yeah, they did use, uh, mortars, rockets, and, and guns. But as this gorilla mentioned to a friend of mine, the most effective ones are a knife. And- Well, uh, they may, your gorilla friend might have known that, but the, the, in practice, there were plenty of civilian casualties, innocent civilian casualties caused by the communist side too. In, in Guangdin province, it would have been maybe 10%. Much less than ten percent of the of the casualties would have been caused by the National Liberation Front in that area, and I can say that with full confidence in the province where I was. I, I don't question. I don't question that there was less, and significantly less, but right. it wasn't. It wasn't that uh, clean either. Right. No. Wars I think there were war crimes committed by both sides in Vietnam and, and particularly vicious war crimes committed by both sides in Cambodia as well. Uh, and and the, I think that's true of uh, Afghanistan, the, um, the, the number of casualties inflicted by US bombing uh, may have been rivaled by uh, civilian casualties caused by the Taliban. Uh, but the number of people who were uh, killed by the U.S. forces still enabled the Taliban to recruit uh, because of the outrage at the casualties by the United States or, or NATO forces, including Canadians and, and so on. The, the Guardian has just published a story uh, talking about uh, Canadian bombing in uh, 2014, I think, or... Uh, that killed a large number of people, uh, up to 30 or more. Uh, and uh, the, 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 you know, aerial bombardment seems to be, uh, you know, uh, a major cause of civilian casualties that allow insurgent groups to recruit. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's true in Cambodia and, and Afghanistan. Um, this is, a, oh, sorry, yes. Um, I, I would agree based on what I saw that we create our own enemies that way. There are a lot of different ways to destroy someone's lives uh, aside from 
killing them, which we did plenty of. But I'm reminded of the um, the decision every year about the opium fields in Afghanistan, which is a very major source of, of money, maybe the only really robust one in that region. Not a lot of stuff grows there. But every year there were there were basically three ways that you could deal with it. You could let the Afghans grow the opium. And the reason we were given for never doing this was that the Taliban would like skim some off top and, and fund themselves with it. But I mean, the truth was it was the war on drugs. I'm pretty sure we just didn't particularly like them growing opium. So you could also carpet bomb the fields, which is something that happened. And then the farmers would join the Taliban, understandably so. And then the other option, which we, we attempted, was to give the farmers fertilizer in exchange for growing wheat. Now, wheat is fine. It doesn't grow as well in Afghanistan, and it certainly doesn't make as much money. So to make up the difference, a lot of the farmers would sell the fertilizer to the Taliban so that they could make IEDs that would blow up American trucks. And this is the, the consequences of meddling in a, an economy without really thinking it through. You're, you're making people's lives actively worse out of some, some very interesting moral decisions that have nothing to do with the war. And um, this is how you lose a war. Yeah. Go ahead, Bruce. I, 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 I see you moving forward through the microphone. Well, we have to understand the history of the theory of, of bombing from the air yeah. is the fascist theory. The whole theory is that is a form of terrorism. That, that's what was very explicit. And that's what we adopted in World War II is why we eventually really lost World War II because the forces we thought we were fighting we became. Uh -huh. <laughs> Should we talk about nuclear weapons? <laughs> oh. Paul, do you want to wrap the discussion in just a couple of minutes and then we'll go to questions? Well, we can do that we can, unless there's some uh, other comment that uh, one or another of you wants to uh, uh, make. We can go to the, uh, the questions. Uh, I know that there are a number of them, uh, including from uh, Fran Foster, uh, as I recall, uh, about the, um, the composition of the, um, no, I don't know how to close this, the composition of the, uh, the, the panel, which is, as you can see, heavily male and um, on the whole ancient. <laughs> Nobody is ancient as I, but nevertheless, <laughs> there it is. Um, I have a question for Laura. Is is that okay if I? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, Paul. You mentioned at the beginning that um, the the tendency is for uh, societies to be worse off uh, after U.S. intervention than than before, and I have a question about that in my mind because I I think that despite what I have said. Uh, I think a lot of uh, at least urban Afghans, uh, despite the damage done in rural areas from bombing, I think a, a lot of people in Afghanistan in urban areas, especially women, uh, f feel that they are better off than they were under the Taliban in 2001. And, and, uh, and I just wonder whether Laura would, would agree with that or not, and what you would like to say about the the, uh, the experience of urban uh, and, and female Afghans after 20 years of non-Taliban rule. Um, so one of the problems with me addressing this question is that I spent, I exclusively was in rural areas. I never entered a rural, an urban area. So I don't mm -hmm. really have the experience of that. It certainly seems, um, it seems like all evidence points to that and, and logic would dictate that women I mean, I certainly wouldn't want to live under the Taliban. Um, going to school is important. Being able to work is important. Freedom is important. Um, it's just that it, it seems pretty clear that what, what happened wasn't sustainable, except for at the barrel of a gun, which means that it wasn't sustainable at all. It's, is it a net good that women got 20 years of education in, in urban areas? Of, of course it is. I'm not sure that's worth the hundreds of thousands of people who are dead. And especially in light of it not being permanent, I, I think it would be wonderful if someday there was a permanent change in Afghanistan, if we could go back 
to, as somebody mentioned earlier, the 60s when things were much more free. I mean, women had education up to 1995. It's not like it's a foreign concept in Afghanistan. It's just that the people need to, there need to go back to that. And I'm not sure that we can help them with that. Certainly not at the barrel of a gun. Yeah, I wish uh, Soraya Sadid would be on this call. Uh, uh, she is an amazing Afghan woman who uh, uh, went to the university in, in uh, Kabul and then left um, and came to the US when, when the, the Russians came. Um, and then eventually went back um, to try to find what she could do to help the Afghan people. And um, even um, under the Taliban. And I remember when I was traveling with her and she told me, well, she had a women and children's clinic in Kabul. And I said, Soraya, that's impossible. Uh, Kabul was controlled by, by the Taliban. How, how could you possibly have a women and children's clinic there? And she turned to me and she said, you know, Doug, there are good people in every country, in every civilization, in every faith tradition, and even in every political organization. And you need to try to find those people and work with them. And she said she, she, uh, she was very upset with a lot of things that the Taliban was doing. And she looked carefully and, and finally found a Taliban leader that she thought she could deal with. And she approached him and she said, uh, what would you do if your wife or your daughter had a, a serious difficulty in their pregnancy? And he said, well, I would, I would turn to God and pray to God. And she said, yes, that's the right thing. But she said, do you know there are professionals who, who know how to help uh, women in, in difficult uh, labor situations? And he said, I understand, but we could never allow um, a woman to see a male doctor, uh, you know, in childbirth. And she said, if you give me permission, I will open a women and children's clinic and I will hire only women for this clinic. And she had gone to the University of Kabul. So of course she knew women doctors that were no longer practicing and women nurses. And actually while we were still in Tajikistan, um, waiting to cross the border into Afghanistan in the early weeks of the bombing, she got a call that her head pediatrician her head internist and her senior nurse had all been killed in American bombing in the first weeks. Um, when I talked to her um, about this, uh, she said she has about a thousand staff um, and teachers throughout Afghanistan. Um, and she had originally hoped to go back to Afghanistan about a month after the Americans left with the ISIS-K bombing, she wasn't sure what would happen, um, but she is hoping that she will be able to continue to work. Um, and she does have uh, women and children's clinics and schools for boys and girls um, all over Afghanistan. And Help the Afghan Children is an organization that is continuing to try to aid the people of Afghanistan, regardless of what happens in this new government. I'd like, I'd like to turn to the um, Q&A, uh, if, if we may, because I've, I've noticed a couple of, a number of interesting questions, um, or maybe it's chat, I don't know which. John, how does one do that? You just read whatever ones you want. Um, I mean, I, Jonah Raskin has, has made a number of comments in the in the chat, and uh, one of them. Uh, let me see where I had it a second ago. Um, he, he asked, "You'd like to hear more about what panelists think and feel about Kabul today?" Um, which I think opens a larger question of that was actually in. Uh, uh, the Secretary of State's testimony today um, is the question of what the U.S. should do about recognizing uh, 
the government in Kabul, uh, how do we relate that to what the US did and didn't do uh, in terms of the government in Vietnam, reunified Vietnam or Cambodia, um, Khmer Rouge, Cambodia. Uh, there's, there's a funny uh, aspect of the Cambodian situation in which, which is coming up again, which is the question of uh, who should be recognized for the United Nations seat. Uh, the, the UN seat was held, kept in the Khmer Rouge hands until there was a peace agreement. Um, there's clearly some people are now arguing that uh, an exile government should be recognized for um, Afghanistan. I don't know. I mean, I'm building a lot off of Jonah's straightforward question about what you think the situation is in Kabul, but, but maybe that's a direction that you can bring in the Vietnam and Cambodia experience too. Would any of you like to respond to that? I don't know if you, any of you, anyone saw the uh, TV report by Lindsay Hilsom, who's an excellent reporter for the British Channel 4, but uh, she interviewed women in, uh, in sorry, Kabul tonight, in the last few days, the report was tonight. And uh, I remember one chilling quotation from her report, all over this city, women are hiding in fear. Uh, so I, I, I don't think she's exaggerating. I think it's a terrible situation. Uh, this one reason that I compared the Taliban to the Khmer Rouge, uh, I don't think it's exactly the same in terms of the diplomatic recognition issue. Uh, the Taliban still seem to uh, be in a situation where they want international aid, uh, which the Khmer Rouge just immediately rejected and cut themselves off from international aid, uh, although they did want the UN seat. Uh, there was an argument about the UN seat after they'd been overthrown, but they managed to hold on to it for another 14 years uh, when they were in exile. Uh, but, but I think the Taliban can be pressured internationally and should be pressured internationally. I think the issue of um, aid uh, to Afghanistan is, is very, very critical. Uh, it is a very poor country. Uh, it was poor before. It was poor during the American occupation, even with the uh, trillions of dollars that we wasted there. Um, and all of their foreign reserves are held in American banks. And um, we have seized those and are holding those. And there was a a, a um, large World Bank um, loan or grant that was also due to come to them in a, in, in a month or so, which the US is also currently blocking. And I think we need to recognize that the Afghan people need to survive. Uh, they need to have money to be able to buy the medicines and food that they need. Um, it, and we don't know what will finally happen, uh, what the Taliban government will ultimately look like. Um, but we do know that the Afghan people are there and their needs are real. Uh, the UN is still there. Uh, the World Food Program is still there. Uh, UNICEF is still there. Um, and there are a number of international organizations uh, in addition to help the Afghan children uh, that are continuing to try to work in Afghanistan. And I think we need to encourage our government to release Afghan funds and allow international aid uh, to come in. And uh, the way in which we will gain friends in this world is by respectfully working with people on the things that they need, um, not by dropping rockets and bombs upon them. 
Um, and I was, uh, the very first conversation I had with an Afghan, just crossing the Amu Darya River um, from Tajikistan in 2001. And this Afghan farmer came up to me and he said, why is your country bombing us? We thought that the United States was our friend. The US was so helpful when we were being occupied by the Soviets. Why are you bombing us? And I had to try to explain to him, you know, that there was a, an explain international Donald terrorist. Rumsfeld. Pardon? Explain Donald Rumsfeld. Well, I had to explain there was an international terrorist organization that had headquarters in their country. And they had flown planes into two buildings in New York that were about a half a kilometer tall and almost 3,000 people had died. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, that is why our country was bombing their country. And, and to correct Ben Kiernan a bit, Afghanistan did not ever attack the United States. Um, actually, it was Al Qaeda that did. And in fact, there was not a single Afghan on that flight, mostly Saudis all Arabs, not a single Afghan. And there's, because of the secrecy of Al Qaeda, I would be very surprised that the Taliban even knew that this was going to happen until it happened. And when it happened, the Taliban asked for two things from the United States. The US demanded immediately that they expel Al Qaeda or arrest them. And the Taliban had two requests. One is that the US give them proof that Al-Qaeda had actually been responsible for the World Trade Center. And two, that they give them a month to organize a uh, loya jirga, which is the, the gathering of all of the uh, tribal leaders, which is how at that point they would make most of their decisions. And the US refused both of those requests. They would not give them any documentation and they refused to give them time to organize a lawyer jerga and immediately started bombing. <coughs> I'm glad you brought up Saudi Arabia. And I'd like to preface by saying I am the least qualified person on this panel to talk about whether we should recognize the Taliban in the United Nations. But it does seem that if we're getting squeamish about um, women's rights, maybe we ought to look at our very dear friend Saudi Arabia instead of pretending that's why we don't want to recognize them. <laughs> yes, indeed. And I, I should point out that American wars are never fought for women's rights. No. <laughs> and the training and the tools of the military are particularly unuseful in obtaining women's rights and promoting democracy. We need to find a different way to promote women's rights and democracy than using the US military. That part of can I, can I just respond to that? I, yeah. I think I'm not in favor of another war in Afghanistan for women's rights, but I don't think the Taliban are going to be uh, particularly helpful on, uh, on women's rights. And I don't see any, any reason to uh, surrender any leverage that the United States or the rest of the world has got. Uh, I don't think we can expect them to be uh, good faith negotiators. I think there's every reason to send aid to the United Nations and the World Food Organization and, and other groups that Doug just mentioned, every reason to send as much aid to those groups. But Lindsay Hilsom in her report on Channel 4 tonight said many of the employees of those organizations, the NGOs and the United Nations uh, organizations in Kabul, many of their employees are women and they're hiding in fear and there are Taliban people knocking on their doors looking for them. And if they do try to come to work, they're told not to show up anymore. So there is going to be a problem with those organizations administering international aid that's sent to them. So I think there's every reason to negotiate firmly with the Taliban to allow those women to come back to work and administer the aid that we should be sending to Afghanistan for the benefit of the people of Afghanistan and not to release funds to the Taliban government, but to send funds to the organizations and to make sure that the people, the women who work for them 
are allowed to resume their jobs. There was on the chat a comment by Francis Foster that I'm trying to find that directly relates to this, but I can't find it. Uh, less you could go to the Q&A. There's about 12 questions in there. Okay. Uh, I, I haven't read them. I'm not, I'm not yeah. one of the speakers. Well, we're, we're about at, at we've gone actually 10 minutes longer than we would ah. normally plan. So um, I think if people want to give some final comments, if you see something in the Q&A you want to respond to, you should feel free to do that. But otherwise, Paul, if you want to just do a wrap and give people a chance to make their final comments and then we will thank this will all be available for people to watch uh, on youtube so well are there final comments that that you want to add at this moment i would love to quickly address some of the other questions that were directed at me very very fast um if that's all right go um, somebody asked to uh, relate the cult of the soldier with the militia movement. I think that's a very astute observation. Um, a lot of the same wording goes into both, you know, fighting for our freedoms, the blood of liberty being watered with, you know, or, sorry, the tree of liberty watered with the blood of et cetera. I think that when you, you militarize society by elevating soldiers in the way that we do, you do um, encourage uh, militia activity. Um, somebody asked about unconditional praise of American soldiers uh, and challenging that. I think that's a delicate question. A lot of soldiers don't uh, join for the reasons that I did. People join to go to college, to get out of a bad situation. It's not, I think, always conducive to blame individuals for getting stuck in a systemic problem. And I think that it's good to stop glorifying soldiers while also holding systems accountable instead of pretending that people who joined are the problem. Someone asked if I belong to anti-war groups. I don't, this is, um, usually I research the far right only because we're withdrawing from Afghanistan. If I, I've been concentrating on this, um, that's, you know, I'll, I'll leave that to you to judge whether that's a moral thing or not. Um, how much discontent exists in Iraqi and Afghan war veterans? I think a lot. They're, not everyone is in line with me. I'm a bit of a bit of an old lefty, but I think a lot of people are very unhappy with how those wars are fought. I, no one that I knew was surprised by what happened with the Taliban takeover, and I think there's a lot of anger and sadness over that. The condition of women before the U.S. started funding the Mujahideen was a lot better, and we have a lot to answer for there. I think that's it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Wonderful. Thank you. Other last comments? I guess I will only add to that, and I speak from way far outside that world, but it might be helpful if <clears throat> America's leadership and the military leadership stop talking about the world's greatest military, <laughs> the world's uh, most powerful military force and all that kind of stuff, which is a remarkable poor record of doing what, it's, what, it's, what, the, what they set out to do uh, over a fairly long period of time. Uh, yeah, none of this, the, the individual soldiers, including up to, you know, professional soldiers who executed this war are not really responsible for the failure, but the leadership, I think, has really not been held account anywhere near as accountable as they should have, not on the policy level, but on the execution level. Uh, I figured out a month or so ago, or a couple of months ago, I think, that if you take all the money that the United States military spent, military aid, direct military aid to the Afghan Defense Forces. Uh, according to the SIGAR, the Special Inspector General, is about $83 billion. And they claim that, that I'm sure this was a, a significantly inflated figure, but if you even take their inflated figure of 307,000 troops, defense for, uh, army and, and police defense security forces uh, at the beginning of this year, and you do a little act of long division, it comes out to something like $270,000 that we invested for every, every single soldier and policeman who was supposed to be defending the, the, the national government uh, at the beginning of this year uh, represented a US investment of $270,000 over 20 years. And if that's, if we couldn't, we, and we spent that much money and we didn't create a, a more viable force than what we've seen, then I think somebody needs to be held answerable for that and not just the, the Mr. Biden for the clear 
I, I make no excuses for the way this was carried out, the intelligence failure and the, uh, the failure to uh, get the right refugee and, and SIV procedures in place and undo the, the, the destruction that the Trump administration had done on the whole re re refugee and immigration system. And not doing that, I think, is absolutely Biden needs to be, and his people need to be held accountable for that. But a lot of other people who uh, could shape these events need to be held accountable, too. Well, I agree with what Doug was saying before about what we should be doing. But I'm afraid that in addition to the military terrorism that we wage, we have another form of terrorism, which is sanctions. So, so if you start to look at the history here and see when Iran overthrew the Shah in 69, um, what follows is our um, use of sanctions against the people of Iran and that raid that wove into our strategy in Afghanistan. We really should have been on the other side in the in the struggle in Afghanistan. But I think I, I think we have to work for Douglas advocating. We have to also be realistic about the way our government uses sanctions. So we talk about Cuba, Iran, and so forth. Um, so that's very it's very dangerous what could happen in Afghanistan because of that. It is uh, uh, more than time. We uh, we have run over by 15 minutes or so. I, 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 I want, wanted to make one last comment uh, about um, re relating to, to Biden. Uh, what he said was, um, what he did is to criticize as a mistake for him, the attempt to remake a country through the endless military deployments of US forces. It raises an interesting uh, opportunity in my, in my view uh, that we certainly never had um, during the Vietnam period when it, all of the people from Johnson on down or up um, were, uh, were defending um, uh, the deployment of US military forces. And it helps to explain why the American establishment, uh, foreign policy and military establishment has so viciously been attacking Biden, whatever else is true about the, uh, the question of withdrawal, um, because what he's done, it seems to me, is open up the possibility for a peace movement in an interesting way that we did not have, well, let's face it, uh, in 1964, all those years ago. Okay, let me thank the panelists who uh, were quite wonderful. Thank you very much, all of you, for um, your quite different presentations. And uh, let me uh, uh, thank John, um, who uh, enabled us. And uh, if we could have a word from the sponsor. Yeah. To say well, a word about. Two things. One is that on the 24th of the month, we will have a webinar on the selective service system, talking about blasts from the past. Um, that is because both the House and the Senate Armed Forces Committees have, because of court actions, uh, and maybe for other reasons, they have now changed the draft so that women will also be required to register. Um, there is some sentiment, though not in those two committees, but some sentiment in Congress that it's fine to have that equal treatment, but that the whole selective service system should be suspended or put on standby and people should not be required to register of any sex. Um, so we will have an interesting discussion of, of that and also the issue of 
that's come up about the consequences of an all of an all volunteer army and uh, who is it that's actually fighting in places like Afghanistan. So that will be on the 24th and I'll send that link out if you haven't seen it on our newsletter already. Finally, um, the speakers are, are not compensated in any way for their contribution. We appreciate that. Um, we have relatively minimal costs on these things except for the volunteer time of the organizers and the fees that uh, we have to pay to uh, for a webinar, which is more than a Zoom program and uh, all of the other things that, you know, keeping mailings going out, just paying those fees. So if people are uh, in a position to make a contribution, uh, there is this, our website, um, www.vietnampeace.org has a place you can do that. At the top of the chat, there was another direct place you could do it. Uh, and uh, what I'm gonna do now is turn it back over to Doug and ask him to reshow his uh, remarkable pictures. If you didn't happen to come on early and see them, they are pictures that he took in Vietnam and in Afghanistan. Uh, so let me stop my share. And Doug, if you're ready to roll and thank you everybody from the panel and thank you, Paul, for keeping it coherent. Thank you.
thank you very Doug. much, Doug. And thank you again, was, everybody. Yeah. Those are those are fabulous. They just really gorgeous. are. They're just wonderful. And uh, we are down to 40 people now from our top of 110. So I'll say goodbye to the remainder of our audience and hope that we'll stay in touch. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Nice, right. nice to meet all of you. Uh -huh. Sort of, sort of. <laughs>